All right, so hello everyone. We're about to get started. Um, thank you for coming to our Intersections of Race, Class and Health lecture series event with Dr. Matt Winya. So I will be introducing our speaker for today. Um, Dr. Matt Winia is the director of the CU Center for Bioethics and Humanities. His career has included developing a research institute and training programs focusing on bioethics, professionalism, and policy issues for the AMA Institute of Ethics. And he also founded the AMA Center on Patient Safety. Dr. Winia is a past president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities and has chaired the Ethics Forum of the American Public Health Association and the Ethics Committee of the Society for General Internal Medicine. He is an elected fellow of the Hastings Center and serves on the Fellows Council. So without further ado, here's Dr. Matt Winia. You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Malia. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. It looks like the other one is down. And if you could keep your sound on for just one second to let me know whether you are in fact seeing um, my uh, slides or are you seeing my presenter mode? What are you seeing right now? Oh, <laughs> I've been on another one thing. There. So Hello. Hi, Tess. Welcome. Hi, so, I was, I've been sitting waiting for somebody to invite me to this meeting. I clicked on the link and nothing happened here. So I'm happy to find everybody. Are we ready to go? We, we have already uh, gone actually. And uh, except that I was just asking someone to confirm that they're seeing the rights page. Okay, yes, well, I will, dispense with this, I will dispense with this very um, brilliant and complimentary introduction of you, Matt, that I had hoped to give. Um, and welcome everybody. And I will now um, mute myself and listen to the presentation. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I'm gonna speak today about really just sort of one slice of an issue uh, that obviously has taken on uh, a great deal of meaning in the last year. Um, but has also been around for decades, and I'm going to argue hundreds of years um, prior to today. Uh, and, and I put up the unequal treatment report here for two reasons. One, because it was sort of a landmark uh, report from the National Academy of Medicine, which was at that time called the IOM, the Institute of Medicine. Um, it came out in 2003, 2004, depending on what version you're thinking of. But um, this this was a, a, a turning point, I think, for a lot of uh, formal organizations in the American healthcare system to start thinking about how to confront um, the undisputable fact that there are racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare quality and healthcare outcomes um, that are really pervasive across our nation. Um, and the, so that's one reason I put this up. The second reason I put this up is just in terms of the background for this talk, which is about, as I said, one of the ways in which disparities come into existence and that we have to grapple with as a professional community. Um, and that's our, that's our history. Um, one of the ways in which this project that I'm gonna to describe to you came about is because in 2004, if I recall correctly, um, the AMA was working with the National Medical Association and the National Hispanic Medical Association and putting together what would eventually become the Commission to End Healthcare Disparities. Um, I was involved at the time with both with that work at the AMA and also with the Society for General Internal Medicine on the Health Disparities Task Force, uh, which is now I think the Health Equity Task Force. And I, I, I have this very vivid memory of sort of standing up at the, at the equity task force um, at SGIM and making a sort of pitch for why folks at SGIM should get involved in this work at the AMA. And, um, and I, you know, went, went fine. And then at the end, at, after completing the meeting, I was walking out and, um, and a friend joined me and she said, you know, Matt, I, an African-American woman, she said, you know, Matt, I, I appreciate what you're um, trying to accomplish at the AMA. It's worthwhile, 
um, but I am afraid I, I really can't be a part of that um, because my uh, father wanted to be a member of the AMA and was not allowed to be. And, um, you know, I, I knew something about this history before that. Uh, so I, I, kn I knew, you know, that it existed. I knew that there were uh, African-Americans who were excluded from membership in professional societies, including the AMA. Um, but that moment will stick with me just because it made me realize that this history is not past, right? It's, uh, there's, a, there's a quote of uh, William Faulkner. He said, uh, uh, the past is never dead. It's not even past. Um, and I, I, that was what struck me at that moment was that this uh, hundred year old legacy has ongoing implications for today. Um, and that, and that's, that was what really sparked the, the whole project that I'm about to talk about. Um, the second thing I wanna say before I really get started here is that, um, and I, I'm trying to make it a little bit uh, lighthearted by putting up a cartoon, but recognizing this is not lighthearted history. Um, and the story I'm about to tell is, uh, it's in some ways a story that would traditionally fall under black history. We actually talked about having this, um, this talk during the month of February uh, for Black History Month. And, um, and I have to say, I was a, a, a initially in favor and then a little reluctant uh, to do that, um, partly because uh, I'm reluctant to say black history belongs to a month. And even more so, um, I am reluctant to say this is black history. Um, and, and it is, of course, uh, black people are involved in this history, but but this is white history too. This, this is medical history. It's our shared history. Um, and to some extent, I feel like leaving, you know, teaching of so-called black history to uh, African-Americans, to black people in the US um, is almost a, a double insult, right? That, that this is a history that in, in some ways, you know, has, has victimized um, African-Americans. And then to further put this sort of burden of remembrance and teaching about this historical marginalization on the same people who were marginalized and abused. It's um, like I said, it's like, it's like it's having another burden. So um, one of the things I've come to believe is that maybe more white physicians ought to be talking about and teaching about black history because it's really American history. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and this work is really about a project that I led at the AMA to explore the roots of uh, a, a divide in American medicine, right? Why is it that there is an American Medical Association and a National Medical Association, the latter being um, almost exclusively uh, African-American and the former being almost exclusively white for the large majority of its history. Um, so the way this came about was out of that conversation, um, and I decided that the AMA, which I was heading the Ethics Institute at that time, ought to look into this history um, and, and write about it. And so I invited this group of people um, to join me in exploring this history. I, for what it's worth, did not ask permission um, to do this from the AMA leadership, uh, nor from the NMA leadership. Um, both did eventually sort of endorse the work, um, but we did not ask for that endorsement. Um, this was in some senses a purely academic project um, to look at this history and try to understand uh, the legacy of the exclusion and uh, racial discrimination within American medicine at a time when many people were looking at uh, the legacy of exclusion and discrimination towards patients. Um, we wanted to look at uh, discrimination towards physicians. And you'll see there are mostly physicians on the panel, a uh, number of medical historians, um, some journalists, Harriet Washington, editors like Eddie Hoover, uh, a number of educators uh, like Clarence Braddock and, and several others prominent medical educators. Um, and the question we asked really had to start from before the Civil War uh, in the US. Um, and I just wanna say as groundwork here, if you think our nation is divided over race today, um, imagine 
the divisions over race that actually led to a literal civil war. Um, I put Charles Purvis on this slide here, by the way. He uh, attended what is now Case Western University. It was uh, then called Worcester Medical College um, and was the first African-American physician to treat uh, a sitting president. Um, he attended James Garfield when he was shot. Um, and in the, in the antebellum era before the war, uh, there were a number of different healing traditions that covered a wide spectrum of belief systems in both black and white communities, right? So there was no American Medical Association. There was no unifying force um, in American medicine around a specific set of beliefs. There were homeopaths, there were eclectics, there were Thompsonians, there were so-called regulars, um, that, which would eventually become sort of so-called scientific medicine. Um, and in that very diverse environment, the nation was increasingly divided over the issue of slavery, right? In the South, black people were literally bought and sold as, uh, as property. Um, and in the North, in the 1840s, uh, 1847 is the year the AMA was formed. Um, David Jones Peck becomes the first African-American to graduate from a US medical school. And a few years later, John Van Surly de Grasse becomes the first black member of a state medical society that, that we were able to find. Um, he joins the Massachusetts Medical Society in Boston. And, and, and yet, I don't wanna make it sound like this was a pure North-South thing. Um, scientific racism, the idea that there are physiologic differences between the races and specifically physiologic differences that justify slavery, right? Uh, the belief that uh, black people are suited, physically suited to work in the fields, for example, or to having, you know, uh, poor mental capacities. Those kinds of things were very common. This is an era when people are measuring, you know, the skull capacities of, of people's skulls and so on. And at the same time, these were not, you know, universally accepted. They were widely accepted North and South. Um, but I point out John Bell because John Bell was the co-author of the original AMA Code of Medical Ethics, and he published essays um, and scientific articles in his journal um, that really challenged these views, essentially saying the reason African Americans do not ascend to the social heights that whites do in the US is not because of any physiologic difference, it's because of the social structures in which they live. So there was active debate about um, scientific racism in the US at the time. So the AMA is created in this environment of you know, widely diverging views on American medicine and on what medical practice ought to look like and widely diverging views on how African-Americans should be thought of and treated. Um, and the AMA is founded to create a national organization that will standardize medical education and create a common code of medical ethics. Those are the two criteria um, under which the AMA is brought together. There is no mention of race in any of the founding documents of the AMA, which is kind of remarkable if you think about it, um, given how riven the country was at that time around race issues. The only way it sort of comes up is around membership, where it's notable for its exclusion. Right? The, the AMA uh, says that membership in the association is defined by regular medical education, meaning, um, meaning scientific training, um, not one of the irregular or uh, uh, sort of homeopaths, that, that kind of thing. Um, so a regular medical education furnishes the only presumptive evidence of professional ability and requirements, which is uh, necessary to join the organization. And I put at the bottom, membership becomes important partly because today, um, joining the AMA, joining your state medical society, these, um, you know, I think they're important. I think it's useful. I think uh, they, these are very important organizations. Without them, we would probably lose our status as a coherent profession, um, but there are not specific tangible things that you get out of membership that require you to be a member. Um, that was not true. Very quickly after the AMA was formed and state medical societies start to form, um, membership in these associations becomes quite important to the um, financial survival of your practice. Um, 
So medical society membership becomes important, not only as a way uh, to present papers, learn the latest techniques, um, but it quickly becomes required in order to have admitting privileges at hospitals, for example. It was also, and remember this is an era when um, most surgeries are not conducted under anesthesia. So uh, you would need colleagues that you could call on for medical advice and assistance during your surgeries. Um, and medical society membership becomes tied to admitting privileges, bank loans become tied to this and so on. So um, society membership at this time uh, is really important. These were the crucibles in which the organized profession of medicine was formed. Um, and um, and the, the presence of race is unspoken, but always there. So I just put up here the state residency of AMA presidents between the founding of the organization and 1860 when, when the war uh, starts. Um, and we've got essentially an even split. And if you were to go through these, you would see that it's almost every other year where you're going from a Northern city uh, where the, or state where the AMA president comes from to a, a slave holding state where the AMA president comes from. Um, and I, I also put, by the way, the Mason Dixon line up here, partly because I want you to recognize that Washington DC is a Southern city. It is a slave holding city. Um, that's going to become important to this story in a moment. So the war starts in 1861, it runs through 65, and after the war, the nation as a whole, as well as the AMA as an organization, are going to need to decide to what extent are we going to accord African Americans inclusive rights in, uh, in American society and in uh, the American Medical Association as an organization. And there were uh, calls for complete inclusion um, abolitionists uh, who, you know, uh, really wanted a reformation. Um, and then there were calls as well from the South for uh, complete exclusion, as well as for rapid reunification. And there's a, a quote from uh, an AMA president right after the war, the meeting uh, for the annual meeting took place in New Orleans, deep South. Um, and he said it would be up to the AMA to teach the country how to reconcile after the war. And this reconciliation process um, would come to a head within a couple of years um, when the Medical Society of the District of Columbia, um, which is an all white medical society in DC, and I'll remind you again, DC is a Southern state. Uh, there were black codes in DC right up uh, through into the war, um, almost up until the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and so DC uh, Medical Society is purely white. Um, and these three physicians who are African-American regularly trained, everyone agrees in fact that they are qualified um, to join the Medical Society of the District of Columbia, but the MSDC refuses them admission because they are black. And there's really um, no dispute about that at the time. Um, it, was, it was recognized. Um, that they were being excluded because they were black. It was acknowledged um, as much by MSDC, in fact, um, which saw itself both as a scientific society and as a social organization. Um, and as a social organization, they didn't want to accept black members. The difference here, um, because this happened in other uh, locales as well, is that the Medical Society of the District of Columbia has a charter from the US Congress which means they have some place they can go to appeal this decision. They go to Congress and they say, we're being excluded by the Medical Society of District of Columbia. Um, we think that's unfair and they should, they should lose their charter if they continue to exclude us. And in fact, a Senate committee looks into this and finds the MSDC guilty of explicit racial discrimination. Charles Sumner has a quote about this. I put Sumner up here in part because of this, but also because some of you will remember Charles Sumner from your uh, you know, high school history course. Um, Charles Sumner is the senator who was beaten to a pulp uh, on the floor of the Senate before the war by a Southern, uh, I think it was a House member or a senator, I can't remember. But anyways, he was beaten uh, on, the, on the floor of the Senate uh, into a coma. Uh, he had to go away for several years. Uh, but then came back after the war into his same Senate seat. 
Um, and this was his quote about this, that it's no doubt worthy of congressional care to have a medical society, but when that society becomes a social club, it's a different character. And if that's done in derogation of the equal rights of all, it becomes a nuisance and a shame. The end result of this is that in 1870, um, Augusta, Purvis, and Tucker join with a group of white physicians, including Robert Rayburn, um, who is the dean at Howard Medical uh, School, um, to create what they call the National Medical Society. This is a racially integrated alternative medical society for uh, physicians in Washington, D.C. Um, incidentally, this bears no relation to the later National Medical Association, which is formed in 1895, years later. But they come uh, as a group to the meeting in, at, in Washington, D.C. in 1870, asking to be seated. Um, this, I should say, is not unusual. At this time, um, states and localities would often have multiple societies and schools, all of which could send delegations to AMA meetings. Membership in the AMA at this time is generally um, accorded to those who attend a meeting uh, as a delegate, so there was not an individual membership model at this time. Um, and this meeting in, in 1870 was widely reported in the medical press because it was going to have to address this issue of race. So the white physicians of Washington, D.C. actually put out flyers saying, if you're a white physician, come to this meeting. We need to keep the black physicians out. I won't use the language they used. Um, but they, they essentially rallied people to come to the meeting um, and, and it's also worth noting that a meeting in Washington, D.C. is going to draw many more physicians from southern states than a meeting in New York or in Boston would have, or Philadelphia would have uh, drawn simply because it's closer. Remember, travel in uh, the 1870s was not that easy. Um, so this was typically true. Uh, the meeting would be held in Boston and it would comprise mostly people from northern societies. It would be held in New Orleans and mostly comprise people. Um, from the South, for example. So um, this case of the National Medical Society coming to join the AMA um, as a delegation was challenged by uh, the Medical Society of the District of Columbia, as well as two other cases were brought um, to the AMA's Committee on Arrangements. Um, so uh, the NMS was challenged because they were, quote, formed in contempt uh, of the MSDC, and they had tried to break down through legislative interference the MSDC, and that this was basically not collegial of them. Uh, they were being uh, unprofessional in attacking members of their uh, own profession um, in Congress. Um, meanwhile, the MSDC accused the, uh, sorry, uh, the NMS accused the MSDC of granting licenses to irregular doctors. This was a, a very important issue to the AMA. Um, I mentioned earlier, irregular practitioners are those who did not have a regular medical education. Um, so this would have been the eclectics and the Thompsonians and so on. Um, so the MSDC was accused of granting medical licenses to irregularly trained uh, doctors. Um, the Massachusetts Medical Society also, one of its own members, accused it of also admitting irregularly trained doctors to membership in the Massachusetts Medical Society. So all three of these uh, go to the Committee on uh, Arrangements um, and, to the, uh, and, the, and then to the Ethics Committee. Um, and here's how they are resolved. Um, the MSDC was accused of licensing irregular practitioners and the recommendation was to go ahead and admit the delegation because those charges are not of a nature to require the action of the AMA. There's no further explanation given. Um, clearly, uh, this was a uh, the, the, this was a big deal at the time. Um, so the fact that it got very little discussion is of interest. It's also of interest because after that happens, the entire MSDC delegation, which is like 35 people, are allowed to vote on subsequent issues including what's going to happen to the National Medical Society uh, and its plea for uh, admission. Um, the, the claim that the Massachusetts Medical Society admitted irregular practitioners as members, um, they admitted was true um, and said, we promise we will, uh, we will exclude them from membership moving forward. And that allowed the delegation to be admitted. 
so they were, quote, plainly in violation of the code of ethics, but they promised to clean out their act before the next meeting, and so they were admitted. On the charge that the National Medical Society had been uncollegial and, and had tried to break down and destroy the MSDC by complaining to Congress, the committee was divided two to three on the side of those who wanted to exclude the National Medical Society was the man on the left, a guy named Nathan Smith Davis, who called himself um, and was subsequently called uh, the father of the AMA. Um, that is a dubious title, but it is one that he claimed uh, and that the AMA bought for many years. Um, uh, and I'll come back to that in a, in a few minutes. And on the right, uh, the two members who wished to accept um, admission of the National Medical Society led by Alfred Stille, who was at that time uh, the vice president of the AMA. And the minority report led by Stille essentially said that, hey, these doctors are regularly, that the medical society is organized, has regular practitioners, these are all qualified practitioners, and they therefore meet the uh, requirements for membership and they should be admitted. The majority report led by Nathan Smith Davis, essentially said that all of the uh, NMS members, uh, not just these three, but all future NMS members also, um, should be uh, excluded because they had used unfair and dishonorable means to procure the destruction of the MSDC. And by the way, they said some members of the National Medical Society are not licensed. Um, that's a bit disingenuous um, because licenses were issued by the Medical Society of District of Columbia. So if you weren't a member of the MSDC, you couldn't get a license. Um, NMS members, some were members of MSDC, others were not. Um, and what they wanted to do here was force people to choose to be a member of the MSDC and not be a member of the NMS. They wanted the white doctors who were involved with this integrated society um, to leave it. Um, and, this, uh, and this majority report was adopted on a vote of 114 to 82 um, with, again, the 36 members of the MSDC being allowed to vote. Uh, very shortly after this, John Sullivan of Massachusetts, who had supported the NMS, um, brought forward a resolution essentially saying, uh, okay, I give, we lost that vote, but let's make it the AMA's policy that no distinction of race or color shall exclude from association persons claiming admission who might otherwise be duly accredited and, and uh, acceptable. Um, that raised a great ruckus. And, um, and apparently uh, Nathan Smith Davis was then asked to come forward and explain more fully what the thinking was of the majority report and whether race had anything to do with their decision making. So this proposed non-discrimination policy was tabled so that um, Nathan Smith Davis could stand up and essentially say, um, our, uh, our, our proposal was about nothing about race, it was just about the uncollegial behavior of the National Medical Society um, and, it, and it wasn't about race. So this causes uh, Horatio Storer, also of Massachusetts, also a supporter of uh, the National Medical Society to essentially propose um, a, uh, a statement that it's been proved that consideration of race and color had nothing to do with the decision of the question. Um, so here's a quick summary of these events. Uh, in 1870, the AMA chose to exclude the sole integrated delegation showing up by stringently applying the sort of inchoate standard of what it means to be a colleague um, and that the National Medical Society had been mean. Um, they admit the two all white delegations that were uh, accused of credentialing problems uh, by leniently applying the credentialing standards that they had at the time. And, they and then they table a non-discrimination policy and instead vote to absolve themselves of the charge of racism, which um, to my mind clearly recognizes the racial implications of these actions. Now, I will say, I just said to my mind, as though I'm looking at this from today's point of view, which of course I am, but I also wanna note that this is not just uh, you know, historical revisionism. This is exactly how it was presented at the time in the contemporary medical journals. And this is the National Medical Journal, no relation to the National Medical Society, no relation to the National Medical Association, 
Um, this is a white journal. It's a white person writing. Um, you can tell by the context of other things that he says. Um, and, he, and he says, here's the question that comes to the association. How do you bar a bunch of black doctors without making it appear that you're excluding them because they're black? Um, they had to be excluded because nothing less would please or satisfy the Southern brethren and their sympathizers. And yet everyone recognized this was monstrous and it would need a plausible excuse. And he goes on to say, alas, this uh, makes a flank move on sacred principles, puts up new barriers to entrance and brings ethnological distinctions to bear on science. The association has unharnessed itself from its code of ethics. So, um, so I don't think this is historical revisionism. This was recognized at the time um, for exactly what I just described. Now, this comes up again um, over the next couple of years where um, integrated delegations try to uh, attend the AMA and it becomes a, a problem um, because it's taking up a lot of the time um, and because they keep having to beat back these delegations uh, using these sort of procedural maneuvers and so on. Um, and so Nathan Smith Davis in 1873, two years later, essentially, um, proposes that the AMA adopt a state's rights model. So they're going to restrict delegations to state societies. Each state will have one state society and that state society will decide which local societies get to have official recognition by the AMA. Um, now, I just wanna point out, um, this is uh, in 1873, 1874, that this state's rights model is adopted. Um, and, uh, and, and this puts the AMA roughly 20 years in advance of the rest of the country in terms of finding this path to reconciliation, allowing the Southern societies, Southern states to continue their, uh, you know, the, what would eventually become the entire Jim Crow system, right? So the AMA formally chooses to, uh, to allow these rules in the 1870s, essentially laying a model as that uh, president of the AMA had said back uh, in the 1860s, right after the war, um, laying a model for how to deal with Southern efforts to continue to enforce racial segregation. Um, so Plessy v. Ferguson, uh, 20 plus years later, cements the legality of Jim Crow laws and so-called separate but equal uh, facilities. Um, but that separate but equal um, sort of strategy uh, would be adopted by the AMA considerably earlier, and it would force the creation of these separate and unequal medical societies throughout the South, including eventually the National Medical Association, because it's very predictable if you allow locals and states to decide who's going to be members, that all of the Southern states are going to bar black doctors from membership. And that's exactly what happens. Um, the black physicians, 90% of uh, African-American people at that time lived in the South, um, in the US, and they were uniformly uh, excluded from state societies. So there were black members of medical societies um, in the North, um, there were none in the South, um, and none of the uh, societies in the South that did accept black members um, could send their delegations to the AMA meetings. Um, I'll mention, by the way, because I think this is an interesting thing to recognize, um, neither the AMA nor the National Medical Association have any racial exclusionary policies formally on the books at any time. Right, there's never a, a medical society um, statement at the AMA that says black doctors can't join. They don't have to, right? Because they let the states do that. And then they say, well, our um, policy is to allow the states to make these decisions. So this is a paradigm example of structural racism, right? They adopt an organizational structure that predictably allows for uh, and in, and in fact, some, in some senses encourages uh, discrimination uh, and racism uh, among the states. Following the war, there are a number of private organizations that create medical schools across the South specifically to train African-American doctors um, because the other medical schools in the South will not accept black uh, students. 
um, by the 1920s, only two of these still survive, Howard and Meharry. So what happened? Well, it would be an oversimplification to blame the closing of all those schools on the Flexner Report per se, um, but I do wanna focus for a moment on the Flexner Report. Um, education reform in medicine was a much larger enterprise than just this report, um, but the report was influential. And it was essentially a secretly commissioned report from the AMA. The AMA's Committee on Medical Education had been doing similar reviews of all the medical schools in the US for years, um, but those reports were seen as self-serving because they came from a medical association which had an interest in keeping down the number of doctors being produced. Um, so the AMA asks the Carnegie Endowment to fund the Flexner Report. They do, the AMA's uh, Council on Medical Education sends its chair uh, with Flexner on the uh, school site visits. Um, and so this report very much looks like uh, the reports that had come out of the AMA's council earlier, or committee at that time it was called, um, earlier on. And it's interesting to see how Flexner addresses two underserved groups in American society. So with regard to women's medical education, um, there are chapters on both of these, by the way. I totally encourage you to read the chapters uh, from the Flexner report. It's a short report. The whole thing is not that long. And these chapters are basically two pages. So women's medical education, uh, they say, um, there are motives elsewhere which might recommend separation of the sexes, um, but in science, there is no reason why the sexes should be uh, separated. And as a result, women should be granted uh, privileges to attend medical school and to the same training on the same terms as men. He didn't find any of the women's medical colleges, of which there were uh, a fair number at the time, he didn't find any of them were up to snuff in terms of their, um, you know, the uh, equipment available to them, the libraries available to them, and so on. Um, and so he, clo he recommended closure of all the women's medical colleges, but recommended that support should go to colleges that were integrated, and he recommended that all of them should be integrated. With regard to what he called Negro medical education, um, Flexner took it as a given as an immutable law of nature that no white person would ever be treated by a black doctor, that the practice of the Negro physician will uh, by nature almost uh, be limited to his own race. And there, and there, and he, by the way, I didn't put a quote in here, but he also recognized there will not be nearly enough black doctors to take care of all the black patients. Um, and so there would continue to need to be um, sort of charity care provided to black patients by white doctors. These were the baseline on which he then made his recommendations. So number one, uh, different medical education, not unified. Uh, black doctors, he thought should be trained as sanitarians and not so much as subspecialists or surgeons um, that you really, and I will say, um, there's some sense in which uh, reading this today, you might think sanitarian, public health, um, that's a sort of less prestigious uh, arena than surgery. That actually was probably not true at the time from the historians I've talked to about this. Um, this is the progressive era of medicine. Public health is very well regarded. The, the doctor as a public health uh, figure is very well regarded. Um, so the idea that uh, training should be different was not, it was not uh, necessarily about a lower level of training. It was a different level of training, a different type of training to accomplish population health because there would never be enough doctors to provide the specialized services, right? So not forgivable. I'm not saying this is you know, a good thing, but uh, I just wanna, uh, I do wanna be careful of uh, contemporary views on you know, public health versus surgery. Um, as sort of tiered in terms of where they stand in the public imagination. Um, but his, his subsequent recommendations were similar to women's medical colleges. He did not find any of the African-American uh, focused medical schools to really be up to snuff, but he could not close them all um, because there would not be a path to training otherwise. So he said Howard and Meharry should remain open. They will be unequal to the need and they will need support in order to come up to snuff. Um, the result of this 
uh, you know, regardless what, it, what his motives were. And he did, by the way, later become uh, a big supporter of Meharry Medical College uh, financially and otherwise. Um, but, uh, but I think who knows what, uh, you know, was going through his mind at the time. Uh, the fundamental result of this is what he could foresee at the time he wrote, which is there will be vast underserving of the black population um, because there would not be nearly enough African-American doctors trained um, and there would continue to be separate and unequal medical training for generations um, after this. I mentioned earlier how hospitals and professional advancement would become very important. And I'll just reinforce that here that being a member of your local medical society becomes tied to hospital privileges. Hospital privileges become tied to professional advancement because you can't get board certification in a specialty without residency type training in a hospital. All the specialty training takes place in hospitals and hospitals typically require that house staff be members of the local medical society and or of the AMA. So these racial bars to society membership become bars to subspecialty training and to professional advancement, which are incredibly powerful. And I'll just illustrate that with one brief fact here. In 1931, there are 25,000 board certified specialists in the United States. Only two of them are African-American. Two. Um, Daniel Hale Williams, who, by the way, uh, was an AMA member uh, from Illinois, also one of the founders of the National Medical Association, one of the I think, five co-founders of the NMA, and William Harry Barnes, uh, an otolaryngologist of tremendous repute. Um, now, there's going to I'm going to I'm going to skip through a whole bunch here. Um, because there is an entire civil rights movement that I want to jump to. But I will just say briefly what happens between 1931 and the civil rights movement of the 1950s and the 60s. And the answer um, in large part is World War II. Um, uh, the American propaganda around World War II was that we had to go to uh, Europe to fight Hitler and his racism. Um, and that Hitler's brand of racism was um, utterly incompatible with democracies like ours. And um, it you know, seems obvious in retrospect, but really this uh, experience of fighting against racism and then coming home and seeing the similarities and in fact recognizing at that time some of the ways in which American racism had fostered Hitler's brand of racism, uh, the sort of white supremacist ideologies in the US with the lynchings, with the other atrocities that were so similar to what uh, we were fighting against, um, created a moral crisis for many returning veterans and for some people uh, who were not veterans. And so people really come out of the, the war with uh, what at least one historian has described um, as a fresh determination to uproot racist ideologies and institutions at home. So medicine becomes a powerful force within the civil rights movement. Physicians organize and participate in civil rights marches. Physicians play leading roles in uh, patient advocacy. They file lawsuits trying to end hospital segregation. Uh, the National Medical Association in particular um, is a tremendous force in the civil rights movement, but organized mainstream medicine is not. So doctors, individual doctors, and some organizations played major roles, but not the mainstream medical association. And this, by the way, again, not just North-South, right? So uh, Colorado, obviously a Northern state, um, and yet uh, Justina Ford, whose house you can still visit today, uh, called Denver's Baby Doctor, uh, delivered thousands and thousands of babies over, uh, you know, a more than 50 year career. She died at 81 and every year of her medical career, she applied for membership in the Colorado Medical Society. Every year her application was refused uh, for 50 years. She was finally allowed to become a member of the Colorado Medical Society in 1950, two years before she died at the age of 81. 
So this was not merely exclusion in the South. Um, it, was, it was widespread. Um, at the same time, there were Northern physicians who would continuously bring, we counted at least 12 resolutions that were brought to AMA meetings between 1940 and 1964, trying to change the AMA's um, fundamentally discriminatory membership policies by allowing NMA members to join as individuals, um, by allowing black medical societies to join as constituent associations, by excluding societies that had discriminatory membership policies and so on. And each time one of these was brought forward, people would say, well, progress is being made. Um, the medical societies in the South are starting to integrate. Um, the AMA has black doctors already. Um, you know, there are black doctors from Northern states who chosen not to be members of the AMA. Well, you know, um, no, no need to elaborate on that, but obviously there are black doctors in the North who choose not to join the AMA because the AMA is evincing racism like this. Um, there is, by the way, also truth um, to the fact that progress was being made. Progress was being made. It was just being made incredibly slowly, right? So um, in 1959, 83% of Northern hospitals were integrated uh, in terms of patients. 6% um, of Southern hospitals were integrated. So 6% is not zero, which it had been earlier, um, but it's, it's not much, right? Um, by this time, by the way, by the, by the late 50s, 42% of medical schools in the South admitted at least a couple African-Americans a year. 53% of Southern medical societies accepted some African-Americans as members. Um, so, you know, that was, that was the pace uh, of progress. And this is what um, people said at the time. So this is 1952, Martha Mandel writing in the Physicians Forum says this, um, this claim that uh, the AMA can't uh, uh, affect the membership policies of its Southern uh, component societies uh, is an evasion of its responsibility. If the Southern medical societies decided to start admitting chiropractors, I'm pretty sure the AMA would find the means of redefining this autonomy. And this, this essentially is a reflection on this notion that the AMA was treating its underlying constitution as this sort of immutable fact of life, um, which in some sense, I guess the constitution is immutable fact, fact of life in a democratic body that requires on a major, relies on a majority vote to get anything done. And the fact at the time was the black societies in the South, sorry, the white uh, societies in the South held a tremendous amount of power within the infrastructure of the AMA because they had the votes. Um, so there was something about, uh, you know, how democracy works that was, uh, that was enforcing, reinforcing, and, re and setting in concrete um, the racism and discrimination of these Southern societies, and then uh, applying that essentially to the entire association. Um, the AMA did pass a few resolutions say, we don't believe in racism, we don't think uh, racism is a good thing. We wish the medical societies of the South would uh, be integrated or would integrate more quickly. And Arthur Coleman, Dr. Coleman is both an MD and a JD, um, and he uh, covers the AMA as a journalist um, in 1964 and says uh, the AMA statement about not believing in racism is like a man standing on the shoreman, shoreline watching someone floundering in the sea drowning and proclaiming that you don't believe in drowning. Uh, that proclamation does nothing for the person who's drowning. It may salve your conscience uh, that you can sleep at night, that you've taken a stand against discrimination, but it takes a concerted effort of positive action to rescue those caught in the sea of discrimination. The AMA um, has a series of meetings with the National Medical Association around these issues. But the reality, as best we can tell from the historical record, is that civil rights are essentially not a priority. Uh, there's no mention of civil rights in AMA records, or by the way, we looked at all the state medical society journals, couldn't find any mention of civil rights in state medical journals either. Um, and when civil rights issues come up, the AMA either just sort of ignores them, or in some cases, as with um, the oath of compliance issue, of the Civil Rights Act, the AMA actually fought against it, um, which that's a whole separate talk, but a very interesting one about, uh, about the Civil Rights Act and its, 
impact on um, American medicine uh, and, and still to this day. Um, so uh, this of course leads in the context of the civil rights era to picketing at the AMA. And the NMA eventually says, you know, we've been inviting the AMA and the American Hospital Association too, to join us in our efforts to integrate hospitals, to achieve the civil rights goals that, they all, that we all say we have um, mul multiple times. And the AMA uh, and the AHA keep uh, neglecting us and not really participating. And now, uh, uh, as NMA President Cobb stated by 1963, events have passed beyond them. The initiative offered is no longer theirs to accept. And he was right, right? Because 1964, early in 64, President Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act. Um, and this in conjunction with the passage of Medicare and Medicaid creates the financial incentive to integrate American medicine and American medical uh, 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 facilities. Um, the famous story of this is the two towers at Grady Hospital in Atlanta, one of which was a black tower, one of which was a white tower. And if they didn't integrate, they were not going get to get any Medicare money. And so literally overnight, in one night, they shuttled patients back and forth so that they would have an integrated hospital so that they could accept funds from Medicare. So between the two of those things, Medicare and the Civil Rights Act, um, American medicine more or less um, integrated with caveats that I'll come to in just a second. Um, and following this in 1966 and then 68, the AMA changes its constitution um, so that um, they can investigate allegations of discrimination and so that they can expel state and local societies that are found guilty of discrimination. No societies were ever investigated. No societies were ever found guilty. Um, because by 1968, all of the medical societies in the country, um, following the hospitals and so on, uh, were at least formally integrated societies. Now, um, that's where we sort of brought our history to a close as a project. Um, I will say, uh, obviously, things have happened since 1968. Um, this history did not end in 1968. In some ways, um, it began in 1968, right? So in 1968, the AMA issues its first call for an increase in the number of African-American physicians. In 89, there's the CJA report on black white disparities in healthcare, calling them immoral and, uh, and calling on American medicine to take health disparities seriously. Um, and this, by the way, you know, 10 years uh, before uh, many other reports on this, um, more than 10 years, um, but before it sort of became a widely, uh, widely studied uh, and, and widely promoted uh, policy agenda. Um, Lonnie Bristow, Dr. Lonnie Bristow becomes first president of the AMA. Uh, Lonnie was part of this project with us, um, an, an incredible uh, human being. Um, and he was followed uh, in the last couple of years by uh, Dr. Patrice Harris, who joined us in January for a, an amazing program. Uh, of reflection on racism uh, and its lega and the legacy of the Holocaust. Uh, Dr. Letha Maybank is now the AMA's chief health equity officer. And just last month, um, the AMA decided that they would remove the bust of Nathan Smith Davis um, from the AMA headquarters in Chicago um, and rename the Nathan Smith Davis Award, uh, which has been given out for decades. Um, so this legacy, I wanna close with this, has powerful uh, and continuing effects. At the time we wrote the, the report on this, um, African-Americans comprised 12.5% of the US population, but only 2.2% of physicians and medical students, and even less than that, 1.8% of AMA members. That compares, by the way, to 1910, at the time of the Flexner Report, when 2.5% of physicians were Black. Um, by 2019, there have been some changes um, African-Americans, still about 12% of the population, now about 4% of physicians and a little more than that, 4.6% of AMA members. Um, and the, this, you know, by the way, the fact that Black people are not adequately represented in medicine is part of this legacy, right? This is, this is part of the structural racism within our uh, community. 
And it's also reflected in the ongoing segregation and mistrust of medicine that we see across the board, right? The fact that a few hospitals take care of the vast majority of black patients in our country. Um, these are the, the effects of, of this legacy. So I'll just summarize by saying, American medicine emerges from a society that is deeply divided over racial issues, but largely accepting of theories espousing black inferiority, i.e. white supremacist medical ideologies or so-called uh, racial uh, medical racism. Um, medical schools, residency programs, hospitals largely excluded African-Americans for over a hundred years and medical associations either reinforced or passively accepted this exclusion. And at the same time throughout this history, there were important groups of physicians, black and white, within and outside, that challenged this segregation and racism. And I say that because it's important for all of us to recognize that this history is not done. This history is still being written, and the chapter that we choose to write uh, will be the study uh, for some future commission. Um, if you want to read a little more about this, um, we published a number of articles, uh, a couple of them in the Journal of the National Medical Association. I highlight this one, it was in JAMA and the accompanying editorial in which the then president of the AMA, Ron Davis, apologized uh, for this history. Um, and I will close by saying thank you so much to Tess for, um, for asking me to, to give this talk today. And, uh, and I just wanna highlight some of the other amazing speakers that we have had already or that are coming up in the next uh, couple months as part of this uh, extraordinary uh, set of talks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. And I just wanna say a couple of things because we are really short on time. We have just a couple of minutes. Um, so we had some advanced questions for you, and I know that we will share those with you. And um, we have a lot of just wonderful comments and questions in the Q&A, and so we'll make those available to you as well. Um, there's there's some overlap. There's some, some, some overlap, and you really touched on many of the, you know, kind of in general, some of the questions that um, were raised in, in including acknowledging and uh, repairing the centuries of undervalued caregiving provided by um, Black folks, um, the um, uh, what repairs what uh, are especially in place by the AMA, and, and you touched on that at the end, to begin to repair, to begin to repair the structural racism. Um, and you also touched on this, uh, you know, a tendency or, you know, maybe the reality of people who are not seeking health care because of this racist legacy um, and, you know, some concern around that. So, you know, with all of that as a backdrop, I'm going to focus and start and, and, and ask you this question because I was... I was fascinated with it, and I think you are in a particular position to maybe address it. And it's a question about the future of bioethics. So we're looking at past and present in terms of, of you know, care and caregiving and, and health professionals. But this question is about the future of bioethics that includes um, Black scholars, educators, and clinicians around decisions, around issues, uh, I'm sorry, issues such as decision-making, bias in AI, and public health ethics. And I wonder if you might say a little bit, because we only have a few minutes, about you know, where in bioethics are we seeing some of the, this, these, these conversations around structural racism converging? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, I think, unfortunately, really, until the last few years, there were, uh, there were overlapping, um, you know, sort of a Venn diagram of people interested in bioethics and people interested in health, health equity. Um, and not enough recognition that really the the health equity folks are bioethics folks. They just don't call themselves that. That's my that's my perception. Um, people doing work in health equity have always been doing ethics work, um, but the people in bioethics have not always fully embraced and recognized it. 
And I think, you know, people like Steve Miles um, have sort of criticized the bioethics enterprise for its focus on, you know, uh, genomics and um, sort of individual cases um, to the exclusion of the larger social constructs and, and structures in which these cases end up arising and being resolved. Um, but if you look today, I think it's hard um, even to find an individual case. Um, you know, I'm thinking of Jahai McGrath, for example, where issues of race are not very prominently um, explored, um, not always understood, I suppose. Um, but, but this is an explicit piece of what we now think about. And, and for example, our ethics consultation services now actually put this into the mix when they're as an explicit consideration and not just one that, you know, might arise if someone thinks of it. It's one of the things that is um, made explicit. Similarly, you know, I know your, your work, Daniel's work, um, those of us who do teaching in bioethics are making explicit attempts to decolonize, to, uh, to bring anti-racist content to the teaching that we do in bioethics and in health humanities, right? I think both of these have an underlying, um, there's an underlying possibility of just sort of floating with the mainstream and not questioning uh, assumptions and not questioning, you know, what what is the text we're looking at? Who was the writer? Um, and whose work are we not looking at? Who are we ignoring? Um, not because we're explicitly ignoring them, but because that's, you know, the, the great thinkers sort of paradigm has excluded these people for generations and generations. Um, and, and we now have to make a proactive effort to reach into the, those communities and to, and to find the things and to raise them up. Um, we, as you know, um, Tess, and I don't know who wrote the question, but we, uh, as a center, have gone through you know six or eight months worth of deliberation and debate around how to be a more actively anti-racist um, group uh, and how to integrate this type of history into our teaching, into our clinical practice, into our research. Um, and I, I think that's happening across bioethics right now. Um, you know, could it have happened in two thousand three? Yes, and it did to a some extent. Could it have happened in 1989? Absolutely, and it did to a small extent. Um, so, you know, I, I have a the long, you know, the, the arc of history view of this um, is that we get windows that open to really uh, push this forward now and again, and we're in one of those windows right now. And our, our task is to advance this conversation as best we can. unmute myself there. Well, thank you, Matt. And I really appreciate that answer. I don't, I, I want to thank everybody who attended and I want them to know both with the advanced questions and also the questions in the Q&A um, that we'll make sure that you see these questions and get a chance to, you know, to, to, you know, to respond to some of them. This is recorded and we will have it on our website um, certainly by the end of this week so people can review it and share it. Um, thank you for the shout out to what's down the road. Um, we have Dean and Professor Dana Matthews joining us on Monday, oh, there it is. Thank you, David, April 12th at noon. Um, and she'll be talking about some of the issues around healthcare um, law and uh, racial inequity. So thank you all for being with us. And again, thank you. It's always wonderful to be, to be able to have a member of the Center family uh, present for us. So thank you. And thanks to Malia, David, and um, Heather at the Center for helping uh, make this possible. Thanks a lot.